You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Back in late January of this year, the Johns Hopkins Center for Science and Engineering published an online dashboard which tracked the worldwide spread of the coronavirus outbreak. Using data from the World Health Organization and Centers for Disease Control around the world, it gives a live count of how many people have been officially recorded as having been infected with the coronavirus and how many people have died as a result. Media companies around the world, including us here at the South China Morning Post, are all publishing a version of this dashboard. Soon, you'll be reading headlines about the total cases of coronavirus exceeding 10 million people, and the death toll reaching half a million. But there's another number on that dashboard that doesn't get as much attention, and that's how many people have survived. Right now, there are more than four and a half million people who have officially recovered from COVID-19. Four and a half million people who have survived a disease that has no single treatment, no vaccine. Welcome to the Inside China podcast. My name is Mimi Lau. In this episode, we're going to catch up with a doctor who has been working in one of Hong Kong's COVID-19 intensive care units. In our ICU, we deal with the really sick ones, the five to ten person who need intensive care. So, actually, one one important thing we I think we all learned is that there's no magic bullet for COVID-19. And you're going to meet two survivors of COVID-19. One is a 20-year-old woman who moved to Hong Kong about three years ago. So my name's Meg Oppel. I'm a student in London, but my both my parents live in Hong Kong. The other is this man. Hi, I'm Warren Mock. I'm the artist director of Opera Hong Kong. Also, I'm a, I'm a tenor. Warren is not just any opera singer. On this side of the world, he's known as one of China's free tenors. Both of these people found themselves far from home as the coronavirus swept around the world. And both made their way back to Hong Kong only to find they have contracted the virus. But both had very different experiences. So first, let me take you back in time to the month of March. It wasn't until the second week of March that the World Health Organization formally declared the coronavirus outbreak was now a pandemic. Beijing was about to declare zero new cases of the virus in Wuhan, and the epic center of the pandemic had moved to Europe. Italy was in a state of emergency. And Donald Trump was about to declare a travel ban on arrivals from Ireland and the UK not long after he declared coronavirus no worse than a common flu and just before he declared a national emergency. And Warren Mock is in New York, doing exactly what you would think an opera singer would do when visiting the city that never sleeps. I saw opera at the Metropolitan Opera, 4,000 people. No one wore a mask. No one. Also... For auditions, meetings, went to restaurants, bars, nobody wore masks. We've talked about this on previous episodes, how the culture of wearing masks helped make Hong Kong one of the safest places in the world during the pandemic, but also about what it was like to be Asian and wearing masks in the United States. I wouldn't dare to wear one. If I would wear one, you know, people would think that I was sick because that's a signal that you wear a mask only when you're sick. Otherwise, do not wear a mask. That's the propaganda in the U.S. back then. Now, Warren is really busy. After back-to-back meetings, he flies through Germany for more meetings, then to Bangkok, where he planned to stay for a week before headed home to Hong Kong. But that plan was about to change. In the flight, I felt I was a little chill. You know, it's like feel cold. So I thought, mm-mm, something is up. And I... You know, my pulse is very, very fast. I thought, something's not right. Normally, I'm not like that. So when I got the plane in Bangkok, you know, the temperature check, 38.2. So there's fever. Not high, but low fever. But still, it's a fever. So won't let me go through. So 
wait at the airport, wait for the result. So I wait, waited for 10 hours and the result came positive. I said, oh, no, can't, no way, I got that? So, so they sent me right away from the airport with an ambulance, direct a special exit. I didn't even go through the immigration. Meanwhile, Mac is in London and not feeling very well. So I was feeling a bit under the weather in March, nothing too severe, a few light symptoms like a dry cough, a really low-grade fever. So I decided that I would buy a kit to see if I had COVID-19. And unfortunately, it was a hoax in London because they were not testing at the time. So I'd call the NHS and they weren't giving any free testing. So I decided to buy one and it turned out that it was a fake one. How much did you pay for it? And how did you find out at the end it was a fake one? So we paid around 400 pounds for it. That's almost 500 US dollars. It was crazy. And it never got delivered. And the person never replied to the emails or anything. So Mac makes another call to the NHS, the National Health Service that is the public health care system for the UK. So I had called the NHS and they told me to self-isolate at home, which I was already doing and wearing masks and being cautious which I'd already been doing. And they recommended me to stay in London for two weeks, hoping that I would be cured from COVID-19 and then fly back home to Hong Kong so I wouldn't infect anyone else. Were you doing that all, all that by yourself? You were traveling and then can you also tell us a bit about that as well? Yes, yeah, so I'd been traveling with friends before and I'd come back to London and that's when it all blew up suddenly overnight. So she has been ripped off for a test kit that never arrived. And the best advice she got is to sit by herself in a flat in London for two weeks and hope to get better. But she has one huge advantage, her mom. So we decided we'd self-isolate and my mom decided to come down to be with me because it's quite a scaring and daunting time. And she was there with me and we were wearing masks at home because she'd come from Hong Kong. So she had to isolate herself and I fell ill, unfortunately. But luckily she's a doctor, so she knew what to do and she took care of me. And after two weeks, we decided to fly back to Hong Kong because the medical care over here is amazing. And they're very responsive, unlike the NHS at the time. (laughs) Meg's mom is not just your normal family doctor. So my mom is a pathologist, so she deals with infectious diseases. So it's quite fitting. And she knew exactly what to do. And um, as Hong Kong's already experienced SARS, I feel a lot of people were more alert and more aware at the time. So she knew exactly what to do. She was reassuring me not to be scared. Okay, so tell us the experience about getting confirmed in Hong Kong. So I landed in Hong Kong. It was crazy. There was a lot of people trying to get back into the country who live in Hong Kong. They provided us with test kits and we had to send it ourselves. So I went home, I did the test and my dad dropped it off the next morning. And this is how Mac found out she was officially positive for COVID-19. It's the Hong Kong Health Department on the line. They were like, you've tested positive for COVID-19, which was a bit sad and it was unfortunate. But straight away, they sent an ambulance. Um, Of course, it did cause a bit of speculation because it's hard to miss, especially in my neighborhood. And there were three men who rolled up and took me inside. I was hooked up to many different devices. It was very intense at first. So you said it caused a disturb in your neighborhood. How were these guys dressed? Yeah, They were in full suits, headgear, gloves, everything you can imagine they were wearing. Um, They looked very professional. (laughs) But it was a bit scary because I'm not used to that. And the pandemic was relatively new, especially for people in Europe. So it was quite scary to see at first. And the journey was super long because my hospital was about an hour away. But they constantly were speaking to me, reassuring me that everything would be okay. Because as a young adult, being in an ambulance is not something I would ever picture. Um, So they're constantly running tests, checking my temperature, making sure. And it's really amazing that they do risk their lives to be around me and make sure I have the best health care, which is amazing. Because in London, I don't think a lot of people were able to do that because of lack of resources. Mac is taken to the hospital, into a COVID-19 ward, and is about to learn firsthand The reality of a nasal swab test. So I'd never done a nasal swab test. So when the nurse arrived, she was like, oh, it's time to do your nasal swab. So I had no idea what it would entail. And she brought out this long rod, a stick. And I didn't realize the whole thing has to enter your nose. And it's not like she pricks it. You actually have to get a whole swab of it. And she goes in and I'm flinching, moving. And she has to do it at least three times till I get used to it. There were tears shed. There was 
so much pain. I dreaded it because we had to do it every two days. And every time the nurse entered, I was like, please, two more hours till I do it again, please. Because I couldn't keep doing it. It was so painful. How long were you in the hospital for? And how long did it take you to reach negative? Mm -hmm. So I was there for around 23 days. And I had tested negative a week before I was discharged. But you have to test negative twice. So I would test negative, then test positive, and it would keep fluctuating, even though my viral load was quite low. So they kept boosting my morale, saying, it's okay, one more day, one more day, until I tested negative twice. When Warren learned his diagnosis was a mild case of COVID-19, he thought his stay in the Bangkok hospital was going to be short. But that's not how it turned out. I was having only a fever, nothing, just a low fever. So I slept the first two days, then gradually I had a headache. Couldn't really sleep well. And the doctor said, okay, I'm, we're going to put you in a negative pressure room. I was in a normal, normal room. Then they transferred into a negative pressure room. So it's, more, it's better for the you know, virus control. When I moved to that room and the doctor said, well, your symptoms are getting a little bit more severe. I said, oh, you should be on medication. Because the first couple of days, I was on no medications. Just uh, like a cold, like a flu. But after the third day, they prescribed five medications, the heavy drugs that they use in Wuhan and also in Japan. So they combined the Wuhan medicine, Japanese medicine for the coronavirus, and also, luckily, and there's a Chinese medicine, the Chinese doctor in Bangkok through the recommendation by the hospital. So I got the Chinese medicine as well that they use in Wuhan too. So I have... <laughs> Western medicine and Chinese medicine. I mean, heavy dosage, heavy. And then for exactly a week with a heavy dosage of those medicines, my symptoms gone. My fever is gone. Everything is okay. So I was really lucky. And then Warren started the second phase of his long journey back home to Hong Kong. So I was under medication for exactly 10 days. After that, no medication. So just wait for the test result. From that point on, started my long, long journey of waiting from positive to negative. So in Thailand, I waited two weeks. I was there for 26 days in Thailand, uh, Bangkli, Bangkli Pli Hospital for 26 days. So day 10, I was okay, recover. But two weeks, just wait for the re result to be tested negative. Finally, I got negative. So on 11th, April 11th, I got negative. On the 12th, I flew back to Hong Kong. When I landed in Hong Kong, of course, in the, at the Expo, Asia Expo, you get, get another test. So I went back home that night. On the 13th of April, I got a call from the uh, health department in Hong Kong. You tested positive. I said, can't be. I just got a test two days ago. It was negative. So sorry, it's positive. You have to be hospital hospitalized again. So another ambulance came to my home to Eastern Hospital. So in my life, I... Twice in one month, I took ambulance. I never did it before in my life. I didn't know what ambulance was like. So while Warren is beginning his second hospital stay, Meg was about to receive the news that she'd been waiting almost for a month to hear. I was honestly in disbelief because it had kept fluctuating constantly. So I thought maybe I'd test positive again. But she was like, no, you've tested negative twice. You're free to go now. And it was surreal. I quickly packed all my things, called my parents. I was like, quickly come, like I want to go home. I want to be in my own bed, in the own comfort of my home. But it was really sad because I was in a room with another girl. And it's quite demoralizing when someone else gets just discharged and you don't. So I told her, I was like, don't worry, you'll be out soon too. I've been here for 23 days, like you will be fine. But I was so ecstatic and so excited to finally be released. Did you find out um, uh, staying in the ward for 23 days is almost like an average period of time that most patients would be like? Yeah, um, I, my friend was there for two months, so I can't really complain. But 23 days was a lot. But I knew that as long as I'm not infecting others, I don't mind how many days I have to stay in hospital. I don't want to infect others and cause any complications for their health. So I was fine with staying for however long. I just wanted to be safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. So what were the first thing you did after, <laughs> you know, being out and going back home? So I did isolate for a bit after because I didn't want to be straight out of hospital roaming the streets of Hong Kong because people would be skeptical still, even though I had tested negative twice. 
Both of these people are official survivors of the virus that has killed nearly half a million people worldwide. But just like the pandemic itself, their journey isn't over yet, and their lives are changed forever. And Warren Mark, who has lost his job and watched his industry collapse, along with millions of other professionals in performing arts around the world, he's got one word that sums up his priority in life. After this experience, can you tell us if you have ever been stigmatized at all being a COVID nineteen patient? So I was diagnosed in March, which is quite early for Europe, and there was a stigma surrounding Corona. And I only realized when I held a Q and A on my Instagram that a lot of people came forward saying, "Thank you for speaking up and using your platform to answer questions that we're too scared to answer," because I had a lot of people who I didn't know who actually were diagnosed with Corona. And they're quite scared to speak up because of the stigma surrounding it, and the assumptions people make.、Um, but luckily in Hong Kong, I think the primary focus was to get healthy, so the stigma wasn't as intense as it was in Europe, which was quite nice. But I do have a lot of Chinese friends who were in the UK at the time, and of course they had faced a lot of backlash, way more than I could ever understand or experience. And a few of them were actually quite scared to go back to university or even wear masks. Because of the stigma surrounding that, and an Asian being in London, which is quite unfortunate, and sad because they're trying to protect others and themselves, and it's sad that health was their priority, yet they were made to face these consequences based on how they looked and where they were from. How many people have been asking you these questions on Instagram? Can you tell us about that experience too? So it was the first time I'd ever done a Q and A on Instagram, and it was crazy to see how many people were. Misinformed for the most part, and really skeptical and scared. And I think being asymptomatic, I kind of reassured them that Corona isn't just a death toll statistic. There are a lot of survivors. You can overcome this virus really quickly and really efficiently too. So it's more using my platform to reassure people and educate them how to be safe and healthy. And Warren Mark, who has lost his job. And watched his industry collapse, along with millions of other professionals in performing arts around the world. He's got one word that sums up his priority in life after this experience: health. It's most important. Keep healthy. Without health, doesn't matter how much money, how much power, means nothing. Doesn't matter how famous you are, how active you're on stage. Without health, you're nobody. I knew that, but now after I, you know. I'm a survivor of the coronavirus. I know how important it is for me to keep healthy even more. Right now, I I jog six kilometers a day for the past ten days, every day. <laughs> so keep fit, and I feel good. That's important. I should say Hong Kong is one of the best place controlling the coronavirus. You know, okay, we have 7.5 million people, only 1,039 cases, and only four deaths. That's so low. It's amazing. So everybody wears masks on the street, everywhere in the office, and、uh, people have the sense, the conscience, to be careful, to control the spread of the virus. Back in April, we spoke with a woman working on the front line of the pandemic, caring for patients in the COVID-19 intensive care units here in Hong Kong. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Mani Mala. I'm an intensivist working in Princess Margaret Hospital. We thought we would check in with her to find out what she has seen and what she's learned from treating COVID-19 patients over the past few months. In our ICU, we deal with the really sick ones, the five to ten person who need intensive care. So, actually, one one important thing we I think we all learned is that there's no magic bullet for COVID-19、um, patients. What they actually need. Is、uh, very very intensive supportive care the sick ones. So most of them come in with、uh, you know lung failure, so they need ventilator support. They have other organs which are failing, so we need to support those organs. What they need is actually good nursing care, good、uh, intensive support. Some of them have been with us for over a month on the ventilator. So what they need is care.、Um, you know, daily taking care of their lungs, their other organs, supporting them. And and actually giving them time for these organs to recover. And Dr. Manny Mala 
talks about the most important thing they learned about successfully treating people seriously ill with COVID-19. They needed time. Time to focus on each and single patient to properly do the job. We got time to deal with these patients, give them the care that they need, and actually uh, they could recover and go back to the ward or go back to the society. So that's one thing as a team we learned that we need this time. We can't have an overburdened ICU where we have to keep juggling our patients, pushing them away before they're cured. So I think that's a major, most important takeaway point that we uh, learned uh, during this time. And the other thing Dr. Manny Mala and her team learned is that recovering from COVID-19 is not a simple upward curve. She talks about the frustrations and the emotional toll on her and her team, treating patients who were improving one day and then getting dangerously sicker the next. But there was another part of the job they had to learn as well. You heard from Mag and Warren about being isolated in a ward for a month, but they were the lucky ones. They were still able to talk to their families while phones and iPads. Dr. Manny Mala's team had to co-op the families of their patients every day and brief them on the status of their loved ones clinging to life of ventilators, either unconscious or unable to speak for weeks at a time. I mean, it's it's very difficult because they hear stories of COVID-19 and, you know, each, each day you switch on your television, it's about how many people are dying or how many, how the cases are going up, saying that the outlook of the patients in the ICU is not very good. So obviously you're speaking to family who are possibly siblings or, you know, spouses, children. So who's really, really worried. And um, they have no chance of coming in and seeing uh, these patients. So they depend on each and every thing we say. And some of them understand it. Some of them actually don't get an idea of what we are saying. So I think initial phases twice a day, later on every day, we need to call them up. We need to explain to them, listen, this is what's happening. Or sometimes it's difficult saying that, okay, it was the lungs, which is not functioning well. Now, probably the kidneys are not functioning either. So we need to support that. Or the heart uh, is not pumping well, so we need to give medication for that. You know, it's how it, it's all this conversation between uh, the family and the doctors that ever existed because, you know, they had to go on what we say. Sometimes it was frustrating telling them the same thing, you know, or day after day that, you know, or your near one is not uh, improving, he's static, or, you know, I can't comment, he's just like how he was the last week. So all that was. Uh, tough for all of us uh, involved. Every day for at least a month, Dr. Manny Mala was being asked tough questions by family members that often she couldn't answer. And the toughest question of them all... Oh, the most toughest would, would my loved one live, you know, <laughs> because sometimes when they're very sick, a lot of them ask us directly in our face, would this person live? Would they come out of the ICU? So... At, at a point of time where they're very sick, where we are, nobody can actually say whether they're going to live or, you know, how it's going to be or when they're going to come out of the ventilator. These are things which were not in our hands. Uh, and also telling them, somebody that, okay, your near one is going to be on the ventilator for a month. Um, so People might not be ready to accept that at that point. But there was another experience Dr. Manny Mala had. One that was both exhilarating and potentially life-threatening. This is what it's like when someone has recovered enough to be taken off the ventilator. Well, honestly, you know, uh, uh, the, that, that moment of taking somebody off from the ventilator, especially taking the first few patients, that was, I mean, uh, so I could just jump up and down, you know. The whole procedure of uh, taking a patient off the ventilator is, uh, is, a, is, is a risk for um, health professionals uh, because those are what you call those aerosol generating procedures because when you pull them out of the ventilator, they cough a lot and uh, that is when these virus aerosols are generated. So um, we need to really take care of ourselves and, you know, uh, we need to make some changes in our usual, uh, we call it extubation, extubation protocol from other patients to make sure the staff is safe. Uh, that said, uh, when you take them out of the ventilator, when you pull the when you pull the tube out and they cough and they actually talk, it's a great feeling because um, after one month, uh, 
being there, seeing them at their best when they were really sick and then reaching a point when they can actually breathe on their own and tell you they are fine. It's a great moment. So, um, so that's when all you feel that all what you did paid for, you know? Uh, so, uh, so yes, it, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a long journey for the patient themselves, you know, and for us, it's very easy to take a breath or cough or, but for a patient who's been on the ventilator with their lungs destroyed, their respiratory muscles wasted, uh, even that, that cough, uh, is a big, is a huge thing for them and doing that, um, it's great to see um, them do that at that point. And then we still need to keep them because we still need to make sure they can actually breathe, actually clear their secretions. Um, we need to make all their organs which had failed as working well until uh, they don't need any kind of support before we can send them back uh, to the ward. So um, so we it, it, it does take time. Uh, uh, and and they also need to, you know, they have they all have wasted muscles, so they need to build that up. Uh, so they have a long way to go even after we discharge them from the ICU, but they're critical until we discharge them. So we need to make sure they are uh, really recovering their organ functions before we can send them back. But here is where the story does not have a happy ending. Both Warren and Mac are healthy, living life with a new appreciation for friends and family. Doctors around the world are discovering are suffering from things like strokes and heart attacks because of the thickened blood. They are needing lung transplants. They are adjusting to a new life with a permanent need for oxygen tanks to help them breathe. We all know this, this is a respiratory virus which causes ARDS and multi-organ failure. And like you said, it thickens the blood, which is something which has been found in uh, COVID-19 patients, which was not seen in other uh, some of the other respiratory viruses. So, uh, and that has its effect, you know, on the pay, on the pay person's uh, organ function. So, uh, the lungs as is, is the is the primary target. Uh, you have the bacteria, the infective effects, plus the ARDS effect. So, a good amount of their lung uh, tissue is destroyed. So, which is why they need uh, ventilator support. And even being on the ventilator, your it's not your normal breathing. You know. You're blowing air into the lungs, distending your lungs. So all that together is a big um, is a big stress on the on the person's lung, and that needs recovery. And that's going to take a long time for them to get back. You know, do their physio, uh, breathing uh, exercises, those kind of things. So other than that, uh, because like you said, because of this increased clotting, we have seen. Uh, the heart being affected, so their blood pressures are usually no low. We need to give medications to thin their blood to keep their blood pressure up. So that has effects on the patient, on the person's body. Uh, you know, so many drugs being given. The fact that your blood is thick. And if patients manage to avoid all of this, there is still one last problem that every person coming out of intensive care unit has to deal with. One month uh, when you're immobilized in your bed. Uh, your muscles, your entire muscles are going to be totally wasted. Some of them can barely move their hands or legs. So that is going to take a lot of time for them to even sit up in bed to start walking. It's going to take a lot of physio. So these are some of the some of the things that you know we are going to see again from all these uh, uh, recovering uh, patients. They need a lot of uh, physio to develop their muscle power, their lung power. Uh, to get their kidneys up and going, so um, so yes, it, it, the 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 ones who have uh, been very sick uh, still would require a lot of time to get back to uh, their near normal functions. Back in April, we asked Dr. Manimala what were her fears, what was keeping her up at night, and what was she worried about. Three months later. We ask her the same questions. I mean, it's it's different. So uh, personally, for me, my, I have uh, a lot of concerns. My family, my parents are back in India, where they're having a their first wave, as they call it. My brothers in the United States, where they are talking about the second wave, probably. So these are so as long as it's a pandemic, uh, nobody is free. We in Hong Kong are going to a new normal life where we are going out, stepping out. But it's just that any time, because it's a pandemic, once you have a community spread, you need to go back to your homes. There's no other way we can control it. So 
at this point, uh, we are all stepping out. You know, it's a balance between our economic and our health system. So at this point, since we don't see any any uh, local cases in Hong Kong uh, or a big increase in the number, uh, I think uh, pe- it's fair enough if people are going out wearing their mask, you know, still maintaining social distancing. Uh, that's why I call it a new normal if we do that. But it's difficult for people to stay in lockdown for you know the lockdown fatigue as they call it comes in and it's not going to work so i think at this point hong kong is in a good place uh, but as as most people say the fear of a second wave is there the fear of the second wave is there and until a vaccine is found the new normal is here Every time you hear those numbers of how many people are infected and how many people died, always remember there is a third number. That is the millions of people who have survived. My name is Mimi Lau. Thank you for listening to our latest Inside China podcast. Keep up to date with the latest development with our 24-hour coverage on the South China Morning Post website scmp.com Stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask and see you soon. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture and society.